ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا All praise is due to Allah. We praise Him. We seek His assistance and we ask His forgiveness. And we seek refuge with Allah from the evil within our souls and the consequences of our bad deeds. May yahdihi Allah fala mudilla lah. Wa may yudlil fala hadiya lah. Whosoever Allah guides, no one can lead astray. And whosoever Allah allows to go astray because they do not want any guidance that none can guide. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا And I bear witness that none is worthy of worship except Allah alone with no partners And I bear witness that Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم is his servant and his messenger May Allah exalt his mention, grant him peace his companions and all those who follow them on their righteous path until the day of judgment. Amma ba'd, as to what follows, brothers and sisters in Islam, it is no secret to any of you that the most important organ in the body is the heart. The heart. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith which is narrated by both by Bukhari and Muslim, the end of the hadith goes on to say, "Ala inna fil jasadi mudga. Ida salahat salah al jasadu kulluh, wa ida fasadat fasad al jasadu kulluh. Ala wa hi al qalb." Verily, in the body there is a piece of flesh, a morsel, an organ. If it is sound, then the whole body will be sound. We're not talking about physical illnesses here, a heart problem which will cause body problems. No, we're talking about in terms of faith, in terms of belief. And if it is corrupt, then the whole body will be corrupt. And that is the heart. So the Prophet Wasallam taught us that the heart is the fundamental organ wherein we establish our belief. This heart which Allah has given us, Allah has commanded us to use it to love Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala truly not only by statements to love his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam truly not only by statements to love the righteous people those whom Allah loves and similarly we were commanded to love the enemy of Allah to hate excuse me the enemies of Allah the shaitan and his soldiers and to hate the wickedness and corruption and disbelief and all this is in the heart but in fact, the topic tonight is not the heart. The title says, what is between the jaws, restrain it. What is that? The tongue. This tiny, you know, nasty looking organ, which can be used in so many diverse ways. It's almost unbelievable. How can this tongue have such a vast, effect on the children of Adam. This tongue is directly related to the heart because it expresses what's in the heart. It is whatever is in the heart, how do you express it? That love, that love which you have for Allah and His Messenger is expressed when you say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's how it is. Of course, along with the feelings. And so you find a heart which contains belief will say statements of belief. And a heart which contains disbelief will make blasphemous statements which contain disbelief. So the tongue expresses the heart. There's a direct relation between them. So much so that in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, in an authentic narration, the Prophet wasallam said, the Iman of a servant shall not be upright until his heart is upright and his heart shall not be upright until his tongue is upright your iman will not be upright until your heart is upright and your heart will not be upright sound until your tongue is upright so the question which remains for me and you to ask ourselves and answer accordingly 
how is our heart? And then how are our tongues? Are they corrupt or otherwise? The affair of the tongue is so dangerous that the Prophet ﷺ told us in an authentic narration that when you rise in the morning, every single morning, not just you, all the children of Adam, the body parts address the tongue and they say to the tongue, اِتَّقِ اللَّهَ فِينَا فَإِنَّمَا نَحْنُ بِكْ فَإِنْ إِسْتَقَمْتَ إِسْتَقَمْنَا وَإِنْ إِعْوَجَجْتَ إِعْوَجَجْنَا Your body parts say to your tongue every morning, Fear Allah concerning us. Verily, we are all dependent on you. If you are upright, if you are straight, if you are sound, if you are good, then we will be the same. But if you are crooked, if you are twisted, if you are corrupt, then we will be the same. Every single morning, everything that we do, our whole bodies are dependent on our tongues. This tongue which is used extensively every day. Um, so much so that if we were to write down, if we were to you know, hire someone who will just transcribe what you say, you know, type it out, he may never finish. The 24 hours will be up and he will be still trying to keep up with the words that are said per one day. Even though some of our righteous predecessors used to count how many words they would say from one Friday to the next Friday. How many words they said in a whole week can be counted. Can you do that? Can I do that? Allahumma sta'an. There's a huge difference between us. <coughs> it does not mean that we don't strive. So then the point here is our tongues. How are we using them? Allow me to quote to you a number of narrations which emphasize the importance of the tongue. First of which is the famous hadith of Uqbat ibn Amir radiallahu anhu wa ardah. Qult, ya Rasulallah, man najat? He said, I said, O Messenger of Allah, how do I attain safety, salvation, peace? How is that acquired? He alayhi salatu wasalam said, Amsik alayka lisanak, wal yasa'aka baytuk, wabki ala khati'atik. He said, restrain your tongue. In another narration, amlik alayka lisanak. Properly own your tongue. Meaning you own it, don't let it own you. You tell it what to do, don't let your tongue tell you what to do. Properly conduct, restrain your tongue. And let your house suffice you. The scholars of tafsir, like the hadith is in Tirmidhi, so in Tahfat al Ahwadi, when he was making the commentary on this particular hadith, he said what is intended that try to avoid over socializing. Let your house be sufficient for you so you may dedicate some time to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't over socialize. That's what is intended by Wal Yasaka Baytuk. Let your house be enough for you. Don't go beyond that. Wabki ala khati'atik and weep over your sins. When you make sins, which we all do abundantly, we need to cry. If we're not crying, it's a big problem. You know, in your car, there's the gauge, the indicator. It tells you when your car is running on empty. So you go to the gas station and you make sure you fill up some gas before you go to Mecca for your Umrah. You can't go to Mecca with, on empty. We dealt that with, with that before. It's an indicator. And these indicators were placed for your own convenience and benefit. If you were to ignore them, you will be destroyed. Right or wrong? Right. I will answer on your behalf. And when your heart is so dead, when our hearts are so dead, that we sin and we don't weep, this is an indication, just like that one in the car, that there's a big problem. And if we're not reaching the stage, then Allah al-musta'an, then we are really in trouble. So brothers and sisters, this is something what we must be aware of. Yes, we disobey Allah. No one can claim otherwise. But you must and we must and I must feel regretful, remorseful, and that should lead us to cry. It can be every day, it can be once a week, it can be in a salah every now and then, but we must cry over our sins. Otherwise, this is an indication that our hearts are very corrupt. And if the heart is corrupt, then we cannot expect the tongue to be doing any better.
And we will see some classical examples of that. The second narration, another famous narration, the narration of Mu'adh ibn Jabal, radiyallahu anhu wa arda, wherein he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa about something which will guide him to paradise and protect him from the hellfire. And the Prophet ﷺ gave a number of teachings. He mentioned jihad, he mentioned salah. Then at the end, he told him alayhi salatu salam, Ala ukhbiruka bimalaki dhalika kulli? Shall I, not, shall I not tell you about what is the master of all of that? Qala bala ya nabiya Allah. He said, yes, O Prophet of Allah. Fa'akhadha bilisanihi wa qal kuffa hadha. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then grabbed his own tongue and he said to him, restrain that. Guard that tongue. Mu'ad said, وَإِنَّا لَمُؤَاخَذُونَ بِمَا نَتَكَلَّمْ He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, are we held accountable for the things that we say? Of course, he, he radiallahu anhu knew that of course we're held accountable, but he meant, and as the ulama in, interpret in this particular hadith, that every single thing, you know, of course, you enter Islam through something you say. So, of course, you're held accountable for your statements. The Prophet ﷺ told them, ya Mu'adh. May your mother bereave you. What does that mean? This is an expression used by the Arabs that is met metaphorical and not literal. It is not meant in the literal sense. It means, may you die and your mother grieve over you, over your loss. That's what it means. It is used by the Arabs not to be meant literally, okay? So he's making dua against him. This means that it's a way of showing how great that thing that what person heard is. So this is the reaction to show the greatness of the affair. Not that he's making dua against him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then he told them, alayhi salatu salam, does anything wind up throwing the people on their faces, or he said, on their noses in the hellfire, except the earnings of their tongues what is the main reason while people would be dragged on their face into jahannam this tongue this is the consequences of the tongue this is the second narration the third narration which supports that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said inna al abda la yatakallamu bil kalimati la yatabayyanu fiha yahwi biha fi an nar abada ma bayna al mashriq wal maghrib the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said Verily, the slave will utter a word, a single word. He does not pay attention to it. He does not realize the weight of this word that he says. It will throw him in the hellfire, the distance between the east and the west. A word. Al-kalima. Inna al-abda. La yatakallamu bil kalimati. Not kalimat. Kalimat. Words. Kalima. Word. One word, and we will see in what areas that one word is, and will land someone in the hellfire. Wal-iyadu billah. Tayyib, you may be asking, concerning what? What are the things that we are supposed to avoid? Guard my tongue against what? Stop giving da'wah? Am I supposed to restrain my tongue from giving da'wah? Am I supposed to restrain my tongue from enjoining what is good, forbidding what is evil? Is it from reciting the Quran, remembrance of Allah? What is it that you are supposed to avoid? Brothers and sisters, what we are supposed to avoid are many things. We will mention tonight four, four of them, who are the most common and fundamental. First of which is ghiba. What is ghiba in English? Backbiting. Now, <coughs> I came up with something of my own. I don't know if the English instructors, uh, English language instructors will agree with me on this one or not. This is my own uh, analyzation of the word. One may accept or one may reject. I was explaining to some people some days ago what backbiting meant. And they had an issue in understanding. So somehow, by the grace of Allah, I tried to derive the meaning from the actual word. Back. Bite, right. Back, that's a one of two meanings. Either your back or in your back, meaning in your absence, behind you. Bite. Now, if somebody was to bite you, does it feel good or does it hurt? It hurts, right? So backbiting is hurting someone in their back. Maybe this is where they got the meaning from, right? It's my own, my own effort. You know, it may be good, it may be bad. However, the point being, 
This is how I got it together. Back, bite. But you know what? Islamically, this is exactly what it means. The Prophet وسلم, said an authentic narration to Sahaba. أَتَدْرُونَ مَا الْغِيبَ Do you know what backbiting is? قَالُوا اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَعْلَمُ Allah and His Messenger know best. قَالَ ذِكْرُكَ أَخَاكَ بِمَا يَكْرَهُ Please turn off your phones. قَالَ ذِكْرُكَ أَخَاكَ بِمَا يَكْرَهُ Mentioning something about your brother which he would hate. Mentioning something about your brother which he would hate. قالوا أو قيل أرأيت إن كان في أخي ما أقول. They said, Do you see, O Messenger of Allah, if what I say about my brother, uh, do you see if what I say about my brother actually exists in him? He does have this problem. قال إن كان فيه ما تقول فقد اغتبته وإن لم يكن فيه ما تقول فقد بهته. He said, عليه الصلاة والسلام. If that what you say about him does exist in him, he does suffer from this problem, you have backbitten him. And if that what you said about him does not exist, you have slandered him. Meaning you have falsely accused the man of something which he did not do. What is the point? Even if this person suffers from this problem, once you mention it, this is backbiting. And Allah Azza wa Jal compared it to the most reprehensible thing on earth. Let's say, Let's say someone here dies right now in the lecture. May Allah give you all long life and worship and obedience. Hypothetically speaking, someone dies. And I come and say, hey, did you brothers have dinner? Say, no brother, just this croissant and the juice is good, but I'm hungry. Say, okay, how about we eat this brother? He just died. Would you eat? Would anyone join on this dinner? You're not answering, meaning you're thinking about it? Please. I want everyone to, say, everyone to say no. No, you wouldn't eat this. A dead man? A dead brother? You won't eat him, you won't eat him alive. Let alone dead. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَن يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِهْتُمُهُ Do not backbite one another. Would one of you eat his, the flesh of his dead brother? Nay, you would hate it. This is in the Quran. This is in the Quran. Allah teaching us that backbiting someone, a Muslim, is like eating him dead. This is reprehensible. And how do you do so? With this tongue. Hey, you know such and such person? Bad. He's a bad person. He steals. He lies. For no reason. We will deal with the exceptions. For no reason. Just, just speaking ill about people. Speaking ill about people in their absence. Things which if they were to hear, they would be very unhappy. We fall into this so often. Only Allah knows. At work, we may be doing this at work every single day. Every single day we eat a dead Muslim. Every single day. At work. We say, you know, this person, you know, this mudir, nafar ta'ban, you know. Yeah, this is ghibah. Inshallah, let him be whatever he is. Inshallah, he's the worst person on earth. Once you say this, you have backbitten him. Because the Prophet ﷺ was told, what if he has a problem? He said, it's ghibah. If he doesn't have the problem, you're oppressing him, you are slandering him. So either way, we are in trouble. In the life of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he was sitting with his wife Aisha anha wa an abiha. And a, a lady walked in, spoke to them. As she was leaving, Aisha gestured with her hand that the lady was somewhat short that the lady was somewhat short in height the prophet sallallahu told her ightabtiha you have backbitten her he said really you have done something if we were to mix it with the ocean it would change its color it would change the color of the ocean because of that small thing that aisha radiyallahu anha wa did why because this was a very serious matter in the deen Brothers and sisters in Islam, we may be engaged in this kind of action every single day in our life, of our lives and we need to repent ASAP. What does that mean? As soon as possible. No delay. Otherwise the consequences are very, very dangerous. The second area where we often violate <coughs> and we don't restrain our tongues properly is in Namima. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Namima is similar to backbiting with an additional meaning, which is gossiping. Or another technical, more accurate translation is tale bearing, carrying stories around, which is basically going around trying to cause enmity between the Muslims by conveying information about the other party. So you go to your friend, you say, you know that yesterday the guy was saying that you're the worst employee at the job. You know he was saying that, right? You know what he said about you. You know he hates you. you this is gossiping, namima. And the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يدخل الجنة قتات أي نمام وفي رواية نمام He shall not enter Jannah the one who gossips. And Allah Azza wa Jal criticized him in the Quran. ويل لكل همزة لمزة Woe to every slanderer or backbiter. And Allah says, هماز مشاء بنميم He slanders people, walks around spreading malicious gossip. These are the qualities of the people who will cause most corruption upon earth. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ walked by the grave, two graves of some of the dead Muslims. And he said, verily they are being punished in a grave for something that you don't consider to be a big deal. But it is a big deal in the sight of Allah. I'm explaining the hadith according to the interpretation, not the actual wording. Then he mentioned why. One of them used to walk around gossiping and the other one used to not clean himself after urinating. Did not do the prop necessary procedures upon using the bathroom. The first one was being punished in the grave because he used to go around gossiping. In another narration, they told the Prophet ﷺ, there's this neighbor, this woman, who fasts all day, prays all night, does all these good deeds, she remembers of Allah, but she harms her neighbors with her tongue. He said, there is no good in her. She is from the inhabitants of the hellfire. Salah, Saum, Ashura, Tasu'a, Muharram, all good, alhamdulillah. But we may be destroying all of that, as the some of the Sahaba said, a person will come on the day of judgment with mountains of good deeds and he will find that his tongue destroyed all of them. And someone will come on the day of judgment with mountains of bad deeds and his tongue will turn all of them to good deeds because of the dhikr of Allah, the repentance to Allah, the enjoying what is good and forbidding what is evil. So the tongue is a very crucial uh, organ in our bodies which we really need to focus on more often. Umar ibn al-Abdul Aziz the Khalifa of the Muslims عنه, was sitting in a gathering and a man came in, <coughs> excuse me, and he mentioned something about someone, trying to spread rumors and gossip. He told him, if you wish, we will verify this information which you have said. And then if you're lying, then verily the statement of Allah is applicable to you. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu in ja'akum fasikum binaba'in fatabayyanu. O you who have believed, if a corrupt individual comes to you with news, verify it. Not everyone, to, every time someone tells you something, you run around and you believe it. You have to verify, is this information sound? If it comes from a trustworthy Muslim, case closed. But if it is not, then you must verify. He told him, if you wish, we will verify. If you're lying, then you, this ayah applies to you. And if you're not lying, then the other ayah applies to you. Hamazin mashain binamim. Slandering people, walking around, gossiping, spreading malicious gossip. Wa in shi'ta afauna ank. And if you wish, we will pardon you. He said, No, rather pardon me, I shall never do this again. Rather pardon me, I shall never do this again. You see? Because it's one of two things. Either he's lying. Or he's saying the truth, it's still haram. Whether it is this or that, it is haram. Type, is it haram all the time? No. No, my friend. You have a daughter. Would you wish to give her hand in marriage to a righteous man? And you've been looking hard. And you find this X-Man. I hope there's no hero, you know, superhero called X-Man. But I mean X-Man as in Y-Man, fine. Uh, you know, he comes around. Now you can't just, just give him, you know, give your daughter in marriage without knowing who this person is. And very often people say, oh, wh where did he graduate from? Oh, he's a doctor? Oh, mashallah. Sure, sure. No problem. Tomorrow nikah. Why? 
he's well, well educated. He's going to give my wife a nice, uh, my daughter, I'm sorry, a, a happy, a happy, lavish, comfortable life. Now very often what happens, of course, he doesn't pray, right? And he's far from religion and the woman winds up being a victim for the choices of her father or the family members. So in this case, what are you supposed to do? You go to the masjid where this person is supposed to be praying. And you ask a brother, Akhi, how is this brother man? Which road does he pray in? Does he come to the salah five times a day? Do you see him all the time? Now, if you are the one being asked, and you know this person is no good, it's an obligation on you to say that. And you're not backbiting. You understand? This is an exception. You have to say, brother, this person is no good. I see, I've seen him smoke, right? He's negligent about the salah. He's praying in the second jama'ah. Nowadays, of course, you say, this is extreme. Brother, if he's doing this, then no one is going to get married. Say, listen, man, this is a deen. Either we apply or adhere or we stay behind. But the reality, this is the criteria. This is the criteria for a person to be accepted. Not anyone who just prays five times a day. The, the hypocrites pray five times a day. You should hasten, we should hasten to pray on time in the first row and all the good stuff that we all know about already. We will deal with that inshallah soon in the very few uh, coming lectures inshallah. So the point being, in this case, you have to explain the reality of this person, brother and sister, you are not backbiting. This is the first exception. Second exception, oppression. If you have been oppressed and you need to complain, someone uh, hit your car, someone took away a piece of your land, and you need to go to some government agency or something to complain. Such and such person, his name is Ahmed, whatever. He has taken my property. This is not backbiting because you have been oppressed and you are complaining. The third one is changing the munkar. There's an evil going on. And you want to, an evil in the masjid. You come into the masjid, you see some kids playing soccer in the masjid. Very common today. Very common today, you come into the masjid and you see someone dribbling a soccer ball around, you know, or taking a shower in the place where he's supposed to drink water after he finished his, his game, his, his very, you know, uh, tiring game outside before the salah. During the salah, he may came, come and take a shower in the masjid, you know, in the same fount which you used to drink water, right? Sounds normal nowadays and looks normal, but it's not. If you were to go now and complain to some religious person, the imam of the masjid, you may say, this young man over here, this brother, this brother are doing this every single day in the salah. You are not backbiting because you're trying to change the munkar. Now, whoever memorizes all these, I've so, so far mentioned three. There will be uh, two more, right? Or three more. There's one, I'm still not sure whether I will remember it or not, whether I will mention it or not. Um, if you, whoever memorizes all, you know, and gives me the answer, if I ask you at the end of the lecture, I will give you Nothing, inshallah ta'ala. So just hang in there and uh, make sure that you get them right. I will give you nothing, but Allah may give you some reward or you may get some you know, benefit from them in the future and be able to apply them in your lives. I always get the people with this one. It's not really common. Anyways, uh, so the third exception, <coughs> fourth, seeking a fatwa. You need a fatwa from an alim. Uh, there's a dispute between a husband and a wife and uh, they need to you know get a fatwa concerning what to do a wife may tell the mufti that you know my husband you know has done such and such and such again this is not considered backbiting this is four fifthly uh, warning a muslim from evil warning a muslim from evil and we mentioned that this is the first one i mentioned actually I, now it's number five the last one warning against innovators and evil people. If someone is doing a sin that is personal to him, or a bid'ah, personal to him, it's not affecting those in the, in the, in the, around him, then this we leave alone. But if someone is a mubtadir, he's an innovator in the deen, calling the people to innovation, then speaking and warning the Muslims against this person is not considered backbiting. Classical example which I'm gonna prove to you that and, and Allah is my witness and observing me and listening to me to show you so you can feel free that this is not, by, not, not backbiting. Don't listen to Hamza Yusuf. You don't know who Hamza Yusuf is? He's, a, he's an American Sufi who calls people outwardly to Sufism. He has an institute called Zaytuna Institute where you walk into the classrooms and you find children sitting there saying Allah, 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 just like these crazy people back in the days. 
That's what they're teaching them. So this individual is a, is a Sufi. He's an innovator calling people to Sufism. And so we have no problem warning the Muslims against him because he's very eloquent. He will come on the minbar and say these, you know, honey, uh, sweet speeches. And the people are just, you know, mesmerized. But in fact, A'udhu Billah, he's calling him to deviance and other than the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So yes, when someone is outwardly doing the bid'ah, he's been, he's been advised, Ya Aqi, fear Allah, Ya Aqi, the Muslim Ummah listens to you, haram for you to do this. And he ignores all warnings, he insists on his way, then the Muslims must be warned against this individual. So they will not be fooled by him. This is from the way of the righteous predecessors. Now we don't let the shaitan play games with us and we go out and calling everybody in the world without knowing the reality of their circumstances. Because this is the other extreme, that we take it as a habit, right? It becomes a habit to just pick on people and you know, degrade all Muslims all over the world except us, except I and a few brothers around me. This is another extreme and this is not correct. So only in areas where the person deserves it. This is an exception to backbiting. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So these are the five which I mentioned. Again, if you remember them, you know what you will get. The third area wherein Muslims often do not restrain their tongues is that of lying. We lie, unfortunately, sometimes too much. Lying too much or too little is not allowed, period. Right? We made exceptions in the previous lectures to the you know, the conversation between a husband and his wife. And you know, we dealt with this in the merit and the clothing for one, another, uh, for one another lecture before. You may check it out on the website or on the DVD eventually, inshallah ta'ala. I'm not going to go over it again. But lying, as Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ الْكَذِبَ يَهْدِي إِلَى الْفُجُورِ Lying guides to wickedness. وَالْفُجُورُ يَهْدِي إِلَى النَّارِ And wickedness will guide to the hellfire. وَمَا يَزَالُ الرَّجُلُ يَكْذِبُ وَيَتَحَرَّ الْكَذِبَ حَتَّى يُكْتَبَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَذَّابًا And a man will continue to lie and find ways to continue to fabricate lies until he is written with Allah as a liar. And lying is not allowed. Not to the mudir, not to the co-worker, not to anyone under any circumstances. With the exception of the three that Islam allowed, reconciling between two contending brothers during wartime and the husband and the wife strictly for for trivial issues, not for real issues like cheating on his wife and lying to her about that. This is not allowed. Okay? So these are the exceptions. It, from the qualities of the munafiq, وَإِذَا حَدَّثَ كَذَبْ The munafiq, the hypocrite, if he speaks, he lies. You can never get any, any sound information. And today, involved in that is joking. This issue of joking could backfire so bad and actually constitute lies. Once a woman in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ called her son and she, she closed her hand like this. She said, come, I'm going to give you something. He told her, Ali, alayhi salam, do you have something to give him? She said, yes, a date. He said, had you not had anything to give him, then that would have been counted as a lie against you. Just to tell the young boy, come here, I have something for you. When he comes, you have nothing, you just grab him. That would have been a lie. That would have been a lie. So you'll see that lying is a very... Now today people lie in what? Joking. You know, somebody will be on, you know, expected to be at your house at 8 o'clock. You know, you speak to him on the fort at 8.15. You know, brother, where are you? Oh, brother, I'm at home. What do you mean you're at home? Now you get upset. Naturally, right? Because you have an appointment. A Muslim is supposed to stick to his times unless some urgent circumstance happened, he's at home, oh, I'm just joking. This is not allowed. You lied earlier while you told me, when you told me that you were at home and you're not at home. So we have to be careful in the area of joking. Excessive joking to make the people laugh, you know, may lead us to lying. Notice now, earlier, what did I tell you? I will give you nothing. I'm serious. This was a joke that was halal, inshallah, because I'm not lying. I will really give you nothing if you were to give me the answers later. But if we were start to start lying in order to make the people joke, this is a very dangerous area. Prophet ﷺ said, Woe to him! Woe to him! Woe to him! The one who fabricates a lie, a joke, in order to make the people laugh. This is very dangerous. So we need to be very uh, cautious in terms of our conversations and so on and so forth. <coughs> and the last but not least area 
where we Muslims have shortcomings in terms of our statements is that of istihza, mockery. People making fun of Islam and Muslims. And you know what's unfortunate? You know who does this the most nowadays? Muslims. Muslims make fun of Muslims. Muslims make fun of the Sunnah, which constitutes disbelief. If someone ate with his hand, then licked his finger, which is the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and someone mocked him, huh? because he has been brainwashed with the Western civilization that you must have a fork and spoon. Not saying that it's not okay to have fork and spoon. Eat with a fork and spoon, no problem. The sunnah is that you use the hand, but some food you cannot use the hand with. And this is something I always remind myself and the brothers, uh, and there's an, an area here that is very sensitive. Rice is difficult to be eaten with three fingers, unless you're a pro. What happens is people say, I'm not going to use the fork. I will use my hand. And they wind up eating in a manner which is not becoming and not befitting for a Muslim. And you've seen it. Place your hand, you know, the hand in the plate. Grab the rice as if, you know, I don't know what it is. Squeeze it. And then go like this. Imagine. <laughs> and I'm sitting there watching like, brother, subhanallah, what is this? What is this? Ibn al-Qayyim made some very harsh criticism against this person in his book Zad al-Ma'ad. Please refer to the book to you read it on your own. I'm not going to mention this right now. This is not befitting. This is not a sunnah. To eat with five fingers with a whole hand is not the sunnah. So if you can't eat rice with three fingers, then the sunnah now is the fork. Because you grab the fork with three fingers or the spoon, which is what Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullah had explained to the people. That in some area, this tool, this tool, which is from the creation of, the, from the dunya innovations, which is all right, is okay if it's gonna be closer to the sunnah. So either we eat with three fingers, right, which is the sunnah, or, or we eat with a fork if we're unable to eat with the three fingers. If we're gonna eat with the five, then the fork is better off, or the spoon, or the knife. Anyways, going back to our initial point. Some people have a problem with you eating with your hand or licking the finger, and they may mock you. Say, what is this? This is not acceptable. If they are mocking this, if they believe in their hearts that this is something that is uh, barbaric or something that is uncivilized, they have indeed criticized the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they have criticized Allah, who revealed unto him this particular teaching, and this constitutes disbelief. Allah says, "Qul abillahi wa ayatihi wa rasulihi kuntum tastahzi'un la ta'atadiru qad kafartum baada imanikum." Say, is it concerning Allah? His signs, verses, proofs, evidences, Islam, and His Messenger. You are mocking? Do not apologize. You have disbelieved after your belief. Allah called it kufr. And you all know the story of the munafiqeen concerning this particular ayah. So we cannot make fun of the sunnah. If, we're not, if we don't have a beard, we don't, have, we don't make fun of someone who has a beard. If we cannot keep our pants above the ankles, we don't make fun of someone who keeps his pants above his ankles because these are from the teachings of Islam. If we have shortcomings, we seek Allah's forgiveness, we try to change our ways. But we need to be careful of going to the opposite extreme and making fun of the people who adhere to the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And Allah told us in the Quran that these people will be in Jahannam. قَالَ اخْسَأُوا فِيهَا وَلَا تُكَلِّمُونَ إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَرِيقٌ مِّنْ عِبَادِي يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا آمَنَّا فَاغْفِرْ لَنَا وَارْحَمْنَا وَأَنْتَ خَيْرُ الرَّاحِمِينَ فَاتَّخَذْتُمُوهُمْ سِخْرِيًّا حَتَّى أَنْسَوْكُمْ ذِكْرِي وَكُنْتُمْ مِّنْهُمْ تَضْحَكُونَ Allah will say to the inhabitants of the hellfire, Remain therein and do not speak to me. Verily a group of my servants used to say, O Allah, we have believed. So forgive us our sins and show mercy to us and you are the best of those who show mercy. Then Allah said to them, but you took them in mockery. You used to mock them until they, so much so that you forgot about my remembrance. وَكُنْتُمْ مِنْهُمْ تَضْحَكُونَ And used to laugh at them. إِنِّي جَزَيْتُهُمُ, الي... إني جزيتهم الْيَوْمَ بِمَا صَبَرُوا أَنَّهُمْ هُمُ الْفَائِزُونَ But on that day Allah will say, today I have rewarded them due to their patience that they will be the successful people. So the, the Muslim may be made fun of, he may be mocked, but this will be means of honoring him on the day of judgment. However, we do not want to at all brothers and sisters in Islam be among those who mock anything in Islam. If we're unable to adhere, 
then we, we, we admit our shortcomings. But don't let the shaitan fool any one of us into mocking something which Allah has revealed. And as the ulama have clearly stated, there is nothing in Islam which is insignificant. Nothing. Nothing that Allah revealed which is not important. Everything is important, but there are some things which are more important than others. More important than others, like Tawheed is more important than others. But something unimportant does not exist in Islam. So if the Prophet ﷺ taught me and you anything concerning the deen, you best believe this is something that Allah loves, is pleasing to him, and Allah ensured that this will be revealed unto us so we may adhere to that teaching. With that understood, nothing of the deen can be mocked under any circumstances. And let me give myself and you brothers and sisters in Islam some of the realities of our righteous predecessors. Mu'ad ibn Sa'id, he said we were sitting with Ata ibn Rabah, one of the scholars. And while he was sitting, <coughs> a man was speaking, narrating a hadith, and the other one interrupted him and finished the hadith on his behalf. He said to them, Subhanallah, what are these manners? Wallahi, I will be speaking to someone who will be narrating a hadith to me, and I am more knowledgeable of the hadith than him, but I appear to him as if I don't know the hadith. He will be narrating a hadith, which I know more than he does. I'm a scholar of hadith, he may not be. But when I listen to him, I make it seem like I don't know the hadith. Why? Manners in speaking, controlling the tongue. Nowadays, we can't help it. As soon as a brother begins the ayah, we finish it. Not when, when, not when he asks, right? When he, he's just trying to tell you something, we just finish the ayah. I know the ayah, akhi. I know the hadith. This is the, according to the righteous spirit says, this is, this manner is not befitting. Now, we fall into this sometimes, you know, unintentionally, but we need to be mindful of that. Uh, Abu Dawood, rahimahullah, the author of the collection of ahadith, he said that Imam Ahmad, <coughs> rahimahullah, used to never engage in the worldly talk. When he would be sitting with the people, be talking about food, talking about, you know, uh, you know, home, the children, he would never say a single thing. As soon as they spoke about knowledge, then he would get involved. If it was about the deen of Allah, he spoke. Dunya, ah, none of my business. Imagine someone like this, speaking, sitting with the people, they're talking about the dunya, nothing to say. They mention a hadith, he has something to say. They mention an ayah, he has something to say. This is how they used to be. Al-Awza'i said, indeed, the hypocrite says a lot, but does only little. Whereas the believer says a little, but does a lot. It's the other way around. <coughs> Sufyan ibn Uyayna said, a wise man was going on a journey, and he came across a group of people who were having you know, a lot of conversations amongst themselves. He gave him a salam, and he said to them, when you speak, speak like people who realize that Allah hears them, and the angels write down what they say. Speak like people who realize Speak like people who realize that Allah hears them and the angels record what they say. Do we have this in mind when we speak? Allahu A'lam. Do we think of that Allah is hearing us right now? Do we ever pause before we speak? Is this pleasing to Allah? Is this statement going to be pleasing to Allah? As Imam Shafi'i said, he said, before you speak, think. If what you're going to say is good, say it. If it's not going to be good, then don't say it. With the problem with us is we don't think. As soon as the idea comes to mind, ala tool it's out. As soon as we think, we don't think whether it's good or bad, we must say it immediately. But they used to be the other way around. So he told them, be mindful. When you speak, remember that Allah hears you and the angels write down what you're saying. <coughs> al muwarriq said, there's something that I have been struggling against for 10 years and I have not been able to fulfill it yet. However, I will not surrender until I fulfill it. They said, what is it? He said, minding my business, not saying anything when the matter does not concern me. Remaining silent when the matter that is being discussed does not concern me. 10 years he's been struggling and he intends on going for the rest of his life until he acquires this quality. When the thing doesn't concern him, he doesn't speak. And the Prophet ﷺ said, مِنْ حُسْنِ إِسْلَامِ الْمَرْئِ تَرْكُهُ مَا لَا يعني. From the good understanding of the Muslim, the good religious commitment of the believer, the believer, the Muslim, is that he avoids that which does not concern him. 
He does not busy himself with that which does not concern him. Fudayr ibn al-Ayyad radiallahu anhu said, or rahimahullah said, there are two actions which will kill the heart. Much talking and much eating. And these are our field of expertise in this day and time. This is where we, you know, we do the best in eating, the variety of food that is out in the world, you know, we're able to explain to the person how this particular food is cooked, even though none of us, you know, is a chef or, or a cook to begin with, but somehow we know every ingredient in this particular food. This food is made of this kind of spice, with this kind of vegetables and so on and so forth, this kind of sauce, and we know the procedure of how to put the food together so it can taste yummy. But if we were to ask the same person, Akhi, do you have one hadith memorized from the Prophet ﷺ? Usually the answer is no. So we're good at food, but we're not good concerning that which benefits us. And the same thing we could say about, uh, you know, talking about things which uh, just idle talk. So these are some of the reminders. I don't want to depress anyone. I'm the first on the list. But this is something that we need to be, we need to realize. The point being, brothers and sisters, that sometimes we just, we're on vacation, we're just in deep sleep. So much so that we forget these realities, which, the, which our, our righteous predecessors used to live. Not speak about, they used to live these things. So Allah gave the human beings the ability to do these things. We are able to do these things, we just need to be reminded of them. And the final reminder and the best reminder is that